There we go. So good morning. Welcome to Federal Fiscal Office Hours this morning. We're going to dive right in. We have a lot of content for you um, on our agenda this morning. Um, we're looking at reimbursement and disbursement and just some additional clarification around that. We're going to dive into some salary accruals and give some additional guidance around that. Shelly's team is going to talk to us about the um, performance reports that's come and due for federal emergency relief. We have an indirect cost rate update, and then we have our standard updates from each of the teams. So um, we can dive right into the reimbursement and disbursement. So we wanted to provide just some additional clarification um, regarding this. So essentially, most of you are aware we are on a reimbursement basis. So everything that you submit to us has already been paid out, has already been um, submitted to us, and then we approve it, and then it goes down to DAFs. So we're just making sure that we are clear that it is a reimbursement process. You cannot invoice for anything until it has been um, paid for in full. And um, so we've been getting a lot of um, conversations and questions around tuition um, specifically regarding when you can reimburse for tuition expenditures for your staff. And in order for that to be in reimbursed, the entire course has to be completed. We have to show evidence much in the same way as travel that you've completed the travel or you've completed the professional learning or the conference and to be reimbursed for the conference attendance, you have to complete the course. So that's just something that when school districts are approving tuition um, at the local level, that's just something you need to be mindful of that you can't submit for reimbursement from the state until that entire course has been completed and there's evidence of completion for the course. So we wanted to make sure that you have the appropriate um, language around that in 2 CFR. So we've included those um, data points there for you with the language there. Again, any questions or anything like that, please don't hesitate to reach out to the team. More than willing to provide some additional support if you need it. I'll turn it over to Shelley. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shelley Shasi Jandro, and I am the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. I actually think this is Colleen and Barb's slide. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleagues. It is our slide. Hello, everyone. Um, happy to be here and talk about uh, accrued payroll. Now, accrued payroll is a uh, salary earned within a grant period of performance, and it's very important that you recognize the, the proper grant period of performance that the summer, that this accrual belongs to. We're going to talk about, it, it's not necessarily whether or not an accrual is an allowable expense. It is allowable. It's already been obligated and earned. Um, but you're using the accrual to do pay spreads for employees, either contracted employees or non-contracted employees, so that they can continue to get paid for all 26 weeks. So that being said, when you do a, a performance report for one of your federal grants, generally speaking, you've already posted your accrual. That's fine, but what will happen in the office of your federal program is we're going to back those out of your performance report uh, totals because they haven't been expensed yet. They're still sitting there as a liability. So when we look at your performance report, we're looking at totals less your accrued payroll. And that's important to note when you go to reconcile your trial balance back with your um, performance report that your numbers will not match. You need to remove the accruals. So let's look at um, this summer. You have some pay spreads this summer. All of that money is earned. If that employee were to quit the end of the very last day of school, you would still owe that money to them. So that money has already been earned. You don't have to worry about the work days being performed. Um, but you cannot put it through a federal grant reimbursement, keyword reimbursement, until you expense that out and pay the employee. So this summer, you could not use your FY25 grant to pay this summer's accruals. 
because technically the obligation for that happened in the prior year or before the period of performance for the FY25 grant even begins. So you have to be very careful about where you apply those expenses to. Um, I think that that goes over pretty much this entire slide, jo uh, um, Jeanette. I really wanna be able to take some questions on this if you have questions. I know accruals have always been a hot topic. Um, you run into issues with your auditors because we're not reconciling with, in my case, IDEA, because we can't allow the accruals to be expense, to be paid or reimbursed until they're expensed. And that won't happen until you actually pay the employee throughout the summer. So anybody have have questions on this? Any questions on um, what the proper grant to apply summer accruals to? Where should you budget your summer accruals? Your summer accruals can be budgeted in year two or the, the end of um, the 27 months. So you're always looking to pay your accruals out of the second year of a grant. So 2024 would be paying for this 2024 summer accruals because 2025 cannot be used. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I got that got that in there. So this is like a, a trial balance, a copy of a trial balance. And you can see that we've circled in red. When we look at your reconciliation back on your performance report, we would remove all of these costs because these costs should not have been invoiced through the federal grant at this point because they're an accrual, they're a liability. You can't reimburse something until it's been expensed. I think we have, nope, just some general information in the chat. Um, so what we would be looking at is the total of this trial balance to reconcile back to your performance report within your, your invoicing minus the accruals. And that's what we're looking for for reconciliation. If the totality of this trial balance with accruals reconciles back to your invoicing, then we have a problem because we don't reimburse for a liability. We only reimburse expenses that have already been expensed on your trial balance. And that's it for me. I don't know who we toss it to from here if there's no questions. Oh, performance report timelines. Um, I will go ahead and, and take the IDEA timeline. In 2023, we had to do an extension. Generally speaking, your performance reports are due October 30th. But this year, we had to extend it out to 1231 um, because of some issues with the grants for main performance uh, data that was in there. Uh, that being said, I know Colleen currently has um, some calls out for quite a few late performance reports, and I think she'll talk about that when she does the update for IDA later on. Anybody else want to chime in on this slide? I think there's something in the chat. Is somebody watching the chat? Yeah, I and I... And Shelly's, this, this is Shelly's slide, so she's ready to pipe in. Okay. So Hi, essentially, what we wanted to do at this time is we wanted to draw your attention to the performance report timelines and due dates. As you can see, there's multiple reports that are past due if you have not completed them yet. Barb highlighted that component in regards to IDEA. Uh, the one that we will note that ha is not past due yet is the ESER FY23 performance report. So we are encouraging you all to take a look at this timeline. The ESER performance report in particular is due mid-April and is likely to be time consuming for many at the local level. So we are encouraging you to start thinking about this report early and start working on it as soon as possible. However, if you do have a past performance report that you have not yet submitted, we are encouraging you to reach out to those program specific individuals and work with them to be sure that you can provide the information that is needed for every team within the department. Because essentially we utilize this information 
to report back to the U.S. Department of Education. Karen, did you want to share information about the indirect cost rate? Yes, good morning, everybody. I'm Karen Allen. I'm a financial analyst with the Department of Education, fairly new to DOE. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a huge update for you as we're still ironing out the kinks um, and working on gathering information for the plan. We hope to submit the plan to USDOE by end of next week. Um, so I really don't have much of an update for you. If there are any questions, though, you can feel free, sorry, you can feel free to email me and we can um, get your questions answered at that time. Thank so you. I am, oh, hello, I am Maisha Shah. I am fiscal coordinator for fiscal uh, federal emergency relief program team. So in these slides, uh, we would like to highlight some of the points for our uh, ESR FY23 uh, performance report, which is due on April 12, 2024. So we, we have been offering one hour long office hour, which is work in no agenda open sessions. And you are all welcome to attend that every Wednesday at 11 a.m. And we would like to we, uh, we are trying our best to address your concern or any question regarding your performance report. So in this performance report for FY23, uh, you, you need to report all the expenses that expense during this period. So to determine that, we find that people, um, there are some confusion in between billing date and billing period. So billing, we are looking into billing date, not the billing period, because billing period is the date that illustrates when the actual um, expense happened on your side. And main DOE was not aware of such activities until the reimbursement request was made, noted by the billing date. So we need to go by the billing date to determine all the expenses that we need to report for the if for FY23 billing uh, uh, performance report and billing date is is the date that initiates the process of main DOE to request funds from US DOE on behalf of SAU the date is in the pre performance report period FY23 July 22 through 20 July 30, 2023 is likely included in the ESR spending for FY23. So we will uh, need to go, uh, we need to be very careful. We need to go by bidding date, not the bidding period. So as Maisha highlighted, we know that the performance report has programmatic aspects and also fiscal aspects. So our goal here today is to highlight those fiscal aspects so that collectively at the local level, you folks are working together to provide the information that is needed in the FY23 ESA performance report. A couple components that we're gonna share with you in particular is in the performance report, our team has pre-populated those expenses that Maisha just mentioned that happened within the performance report for FY23. So on the screen, you will see that this test SAU, Pine RSU, has expenses for FY23 in CARES, Carissa, and ARP. The US Department of Ed is asking subrecipients, also known as SAUs, to report expenses in four expenditure categories. The four expenditure categories are listed here on this slide. But within those expenditure categories, there is one section of the performance report that is requiring that the expenses be defined by object code. So this first slide that we have for you is an example of the chart for CARES with a pre-populated amount on the top right in the red box. 
And what will happen is the total amount of expenditures must equal that pre-populated information. So the box at the bottom is the sum of the information that is self-reported and those two red boxes must be equal. Within the object codes, you will see that there is salaries and benefits. Both of those expenditures must be reported separately. This information that is self-reported in this section of the performance report will be used to populate section C, the hiring and retention page, as well as the total expenditures for each of the categories. So for example, addressing physical health and safety, the total in that yellow band will be pre-populated in section B, which is the page that is asking for expenditures by activity. The logic in GEMS pulls all of this information based on the self-reported expenses. So it is very important to the individual who is filling out the information in GEMS to do it logically based on the order that they are defined within the GEMS portal. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the total of each expenditure category denoted in the yellow highlighted area must equal the expense categories in part two, section A. So the yellow bar in this slide is the sum of the category expenditures and every dollar and penny must be accounted for. So you, be, you will be working with your ESER applicant coordinator to define those expenses and to determine what is the best area in which to put the expenses that transpired in FY23 within each of the expenditure categories, but also by activity. The question on this section, which is section C, hiring and retention, is asking for how much funding was utilized for specific positions. GEMS will take the information that was self-reported in part two, section A, for salaries and benefits and populate the top chart on the right-hand side of this slide. The bottom chart will require information about the total amount expended by specific positions. The sum of the amount must equal the grand total in the top chart. The US Department of Ed has defined these positions in the publicly available data collection tool if you should have any questions about how these positions are defined. This part of the performance report is asking for the amount expended by the learning loss activity or intervention. The total amount expended must be equal to the total amount established by the self-reported expenses in the reservation column that is in the self-reported section of part two, section A, ARP ESER three expenditures. So the, the red box in the middle of the slide that has a blue number embedded under it, that number is self-reported and is pulled from the information in previous sections of the completed performance report within GEMS. We know that we've shared a lot of information. As I mentioned, we are highlighting the sections that have a financial component to it, really highlighting that that we are encouraging our business managers as well as our, ES, our ESER coordinator individuals to work together to be able to complete this performance report. However, I'm going to echo the information that Maisha shared at the top of our slides, which was we have a one hour, no agenda walk-in open session that is we are making a commitment to be sure that a member of our federal emergency relief programs team is available from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. 
every Wednesday between now and the due date of the performance report. And we use that hour to address any of the questions from the audience members. We encourage you to register and join should you have any questions that you would like responded um, in, a, in that manner. Hello, I'm Jody Truman. Uh, the only update I have for you is again, the CEP deadline um, is April 1st and that is right around the corner. Um, so if you are going to be uh, participating in the CEP program, um, this is for you. And other than that, I don't have, there aren't any financial updates at this point. And that's it for me. I'm taking Ty with slides today. She can't be with us. So for ESCA federal programs, the U.S. Department of Education, um, and then obviously the DOE will be unable to provide information on allocations until the state is provided information related to the newly passed appropriations bill. Um, we have approximately $1.5 million available in Title I funds for summer reallocated projects. The deadline for that is March 29th. So tomorrow's the deadline to get those applications in. And circling back to the preliminary allocations, once we receive that information from the federal government, the team stands ready to calculate those estimates and provide them out as preliminary allocations. We are cognizant it's budget season and having those numbers at hand is, is helpful. Um, so we will be working on that. Um, as far as the non-public school data survey, we're seeking overall school enrollment and economically disadvantaged student count data from all approved non-public, non-profit schools across the state. And this data is used to calculate equitable services for approved non-profit, non-public schools. The deadline for those schools to submit that data to the department is April 1st. So that was, is this coming Monday. So just making sure folks are aware that they need to be connecting with any non-public schools within the school district area to make sure that that data is provided. And then um, our spring monitoring for ESCA is set to open on Monday morning. So ESCA coordinators will get notification regarding that. And then finally, some upcoming deadlines that you should be aware of. We have put in, we're looking to apply for a tidings amendment waiver from the federal government. So this extends the period of availability of those funds to districts to spend down. There was a notice that went out um, earlier in the week as a reminder. There was a priority notice the week prior. So we're seeking public comment on that. And essentially, it's a way for us to advocate to the federal government that SD, SAU school districts are in support of the waiver that we're seeking. So to allow you to have additional time to spend those funds. So public comments can be directed to me. My email address is there. And then just a couple of other reminders regarding when ESDA FY22 funds will expire. So all um, funds need to be obligated by 9-30-24 for FY22 ESDA funds. And then if you have a school that is identified for tier three um, school improvement, continuous school improvement funds, those funds will expire also on 923, so those need to be obligated prior to that date. Any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Good morning. This is Colleen O'Neill from the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education. Um, I am just going through some housekeeping items for IDEA. Um, all districts should be checking the statuses of their 22, 23, and 24 applications. Um, there are some sitting out there that have not been submitted or have been opened for a revision for some reason and just never um, completed. Um, so if you could just kind of take a peek at those and make sure that those are submitted and approved. Um, they pop open from time to time when, when Grants for Me is adding data, such as MOE numbers or risk assessments and things like that. So you might not be aware that it's open. So if you could log in and just take a peek, um, we will have FY25 applications opening probably around the end of May. 
We do not have any idea what the um, allocations will be as of yet, and we send word as soon as we know, you will know. Um, also, just a reminder for SAUs receiving more than $250,000 for a grant award, um, those invoices and reimbursements are required to be billed monthly. Um, if you're having billing issues or need um, help catching up, please reach out to us to request a waiver to bill more than one month at a time. Um, we know that there are still challenges surrounding um, getting bills submitted and paid in a timely fashion. Um, while we approve them very quickly, it has to go through the rest of the state processes. So it takes a little bit longer. Um, so just please reach out so we're aware that that is an accommodation that you need. And then again, just reiterating on the past due um, fiscal year, 23 year end reports. Um, I think currently there's about 64 that are not submitted. Um, and we're happy to help and support any way we can to get those done. Um, billing and right now we're going to be halting billing for FY23 and 24 funds if your reports are not completed. So please reach out to schedule time with myself um, or at Ginger or any of the other team members um, on our fiscal team to help you get those those reports completed and submitted so we can move that off your plate as we start thinking about the FY24 year-end report and the FY25 application. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Megan Dichter, Director of Adult Education. And if you were with us in February, my slide hasn't changed much. Just the same updates. Our AFLA grant, the current grant is ending on June 30th of 2024. That is the last continuation cycle of a five-year grant. So there will be no carryover from that grant. Um, and our main jobs and recovery plan, adult ed strengthening main workforce grants and college and career success coordinators have been extended to June 30th, 2025. So we will be working on getting new contracts or amended contracts that reflect that out to those programs. Um, our invoices are due coming up on April 30th. And then the final invoice for that AFLA grant will be due on July 15th. And that's all I've got, thanks. Melissa's out this morning, so she shared some notes, so I will provide you those notes that she's provided us. Perkins has local needs assessment required of all SAUs every two years. The local needs assessment will inform FY25 and FY26 grant years, and it's open in Grants for Me and due March 31st ahead of the FY25 application opening. The student data is now uploaded into Grants for Me, so if you have questions, please direct them to either Melissa Sherwood or Sean Legassi on the CTE team. FY25 allocation estimates will be available soon once we have that information from the federal government. I think you're seeing a recurring theme here from every team. We're all waiting on US Department of Education to re release those um, data points. Expect these allocations to be similar to FY24 um, so you can start that planning um, using those as a, a kind of guide. And as always, please drop by Perkins office hours on Tuesdays with any questions that you might have. I don't think we have anything at the moment from the Office of School and Student Supports. So we will open it up for any questions that you might have at this time. And I will stop screen sharing. Sorry, Christian, I didn't see you. Do you have any updates? I just saw you on my screen. I apologize. No, that's Do you have okay. Updates I popped you'd on. like to share? Uh, I just from the Office of School Student Supports. I didn't get the information back that I was hoping to get back, but I can just run through a few things that, um, from my limited perspective, because I'm kind of still new. But um, as far as uh, Office of School and Student Supports, ease is a part that I'm working on, and just 
kind of giving you an update that reporting for ease for year one has been completed as of 2524. The report came back with glowing accolades. Uh, we did a great job on that uh, as a department. Year two reporting uh, schedule is already set and for the second year from 1124 through the end of this year. Uh, the year two quarter one actually ends 331. Time is flying by. We are currently doing site visits to the nine recipients of the awards. Um, there will be a convening for all those SAUs on July 30th and 31st in Herman. Uh, as far as opening that up, because what the EASE grant specifically is doing for um, the specific nine schools is something that every school should um, benefit from in the future. Uh, you will learn more about that at the educational summit that we're holding on 8-6 through 8-8. So keep an eye out for more information on that. Um, as far as what we are doing with the uh, providing mental health staff and services for schools, uh, with these grant, uh, we're looking at how we can uh, put that out towards the other districts across the state. So sustainability funding is being uh, looked through by Title IV and through Main Care currently, and hopefully finding ways to sustain current programs and increase those statewide. Uh, for anybody interested in any of these uh, uh, continuing events that we're having throughout these DEI type learning and growing events. We had a book study that just completed, for example, with author Heinrich Nichols. She was fantastic. Uh, we had great participation uh, across the state with that. We also have an out training coming up on 410 uh, put on by the uh, Maine Alliance for LGBTQ plus youth. Um, and if you have any specific questions regarding the Ed Summits or anything to do with the Ease Grants or any questions with the OSSS, please feel free to contact me at Christian4 at Maine.gov and I will be happy to get that back to you. Thank you, Christian. Any questions from anybody related to any of the information you've had today? A reminder, office hours, federal emergency relief for the first Thursday of every month at nine o'clock. ESDA federal programs are the second Tuesday of every month at nine o'clock. And Perkins is every Tuesday from three to four. And when we provide you the slide deck, those links are in there as well. If there's no additional questions, we'll let you go. Thank you very much for your time.